Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you here today. Um, I've been asked to talk uh, about imaging of meningeal disease. Uh, my objectives are to uh, review meningeal anatomy, uh, look at the MR appearances of normal and abnormal uh, meninges, uh, suggest a, an approach to evaluate meningeal disease, and uh, look at some pitfalls in the process. So, um, if we start by looking at meningeal anatomy, uh, this is a, a surgical uh, photograph of a, a, a craniotomy site, and uh, you can see the various uh, meningeal layers uh, from this photograph. Um, okay, we've got a pointer. So, here we can see uh, the edge of the skin with the clips and uh, uh, moist uh, swab. Uh, then the next layer down, the next step down, uh, is the bone. Okay, so you can see the bone edge there. And then you come on to an opaque membrane, which is this membrane here, which is the dural. And a dural window has been fashioned, and you can see how the dural window has been uh, cut around and then folded over uh, to expose the next layer of membranes deep to that. And that little membrane is the arachnoid membrane, which uh, must be thin because you can see the underlying brain surface, although not in great detail. Uh, you can see the uh, vessels within the subarachnoid space, the cortical veins, and also you get the impression that there's probably fluid in there. So the space uh, where you see the glistening is actually the subdural space. If we go through that membrane, we come onto the subarachnoid membrane. Um, if we look at the schematic of uh, these membranes, then uh, we can straight away appreciate that uh, this sort of lime uh, uh, green colour here, uh, that's the thickest layer of these concentric membranes, and that's the dura. And contained within the dura, uh, one can appreciate the little uh, red dots, which are the blood vessels in the dura. And the dura is made up of two layers, which is the periosteal and meningeal layer. And uh, those vessels are between those two layers. The next layer is that green layer, which is uh, the outer layer of the arachnoid. Um, and that's, that looks fairly adherent to the dura in this diagram, but there is a potential space between the two, and that space being the subdural space. Um, bridging across from that green layer down to the red layer, which is the pier, are fibrous strands which are uh, covered by arachnoid cells. And that space is kept distended by CSS, um, and uh, uh, so that's the subarachnoid space. And you can see this, the vessels in the subarachnoid space, and then we've got an example of a penetrating artery extending into the brain substance, and it's taking the peel layer with it. Um, so, the, these two membranes can be referred to as the, the dura arachnoid layer, or what I would refer to as just the dura in the subsequent talk, and then this space and this, this, the peel layer will be the arachnoid peel layer. The important thing about this is that the dura is quite vascular. It's quite a thick structure, so, uh, about a millimetre or so thick, and uh, has uh, vessels within it that you can see. Whereas the other two layers really aren't as vascularized as the dura itself. The vessels in the dura are supplied by the external parotid branches, the middle meningeal artery, and therefore lack the blood-brain barrier. So they're quite different vessels uh, from those in the subarachnoid space. So if we look at the uh, uh, dura now, on this uh, coronal image, you can see a dural lining uh, very clearly adherent to the skull vault there. So what do we see on uh, imaging? Well, on CT, uh, you can't actually see any of the membranes. This is a contrasting on CT scan, and you can't appreciate the dura because it's too close to the bone. You lose the detail. Having said that, you can see the fox there, which is a double layer of dura, enhancing beautifully, and also bits, a little bit of the tentorium. So there's some of the dural elements you're seeing, but the majority are invisible. On MR, this is a non-contrast T1 weighted MR, you get more detail. You can now actually see the dural uh, line in there. Um, the other membranes are invisible, effectively, we're looking at subarachnoid space there. The fox is faintly seen on this image, uh, but if you give uh, contrast, IV contrast, then you can now appreciate the meningeal layer, uh, the dura, better, because you can see that it shows marble enhancement. One can also appreciate these brightly enhancing structures, that's the superior sagittal sinus, and these are the cortical veins as they pierce the uh, dura to enter the sinus there. So those structures are also visible. Um, this is a study 
uh, from uh, Japan uh, looking at various uh, different sequences of, uh, to evaluate uh, meningeal disease. Uh, and they took a series of uh, patients with different conditions and tried out three sequences on, on these patients and then rated the sequences uh, as to uh, their quality. Well, like everything in radiology, it's mostly about anatomy and location. So there are two essential patterns. The dual pattern of meningeal enhancement, uh, also referred to as a pachymeningeal uh, pattern, and the leptomeningeal or peer arachnoid pattern. And of course, like everything, things aren't ever so neat. There's always a mixed pattern also. And this pattern of enhancement can be subsequently characterized by its extent, whether it's diffuse or focal, and also uh, by its character, whether it's smooth or modular. So these uh, images illustrate the two main patterns, uh, the fundamental pattern. So this is an example of the dual pattern. And here, one can see the extensive enhancement which hugs the calvarium all the way around, uh, with the exception of the felt, so it comes into the brain substance and uh, out again. So this is the dual pattern of enhancement, and contrast that with the leptomeningeal pattern, uh, where the enhancing uh, uh, structures are hugging the surface of the brain, so dipping in and out of the cell side uh, in the uh, uh, midline here and in the sylvian fissures. So these are the two fundamental patterns, the dual pattern and the leptomeningeal pattern. So let's look at the dual pattern. Uh, what conditions can give you this pattern of enhancement? Uh, well, it can involve both benign and malignant processes. The commonest pattern will be postoperative, uh, or the commonest cause, postoperative change. Uh, but uh, other entities, such as uh, intracranial hypotension, uh, meningioma, metastasis, and granulomatous diseases can also give you this uh, quite extensive uh, but characteristic pattern. Um, so uh, this patient who's had a, uh, a parietal craniotomy uh, uh, and uh, this post-contrast study shows this area of diffuse uh, uh, smooth enhancement just deep to the craniotomy site. Uh, and so in this context this is localised to the surgical site uh, but it can be more extensive depending on the extent of surgery or the nature of the intervention. It's almost always very smooth and, uh, and surprisingly it can come on at, uh, within nine hours after surgery. Uh, usually increases for up to about two or three weeks and then slowly resolves uh, and in most cases has gone by uh, uh, six months or so or possibly even up to a year. Uh, the mechanism of this is unclear but it may be just a sort of healing reaction or uh, uh, focal arachnoiditis. Uh, one of the most florid examples of uh, meningeal or dual uh, enhancement can be seen in patients who have had long-term uh, shunt surgery. Uh, and uh, they, in those cases, the meninges can sometimes uh, thicken up to almost 5 millimeters or so. Um, and it's very conspicuous. Um, considering intracranial hypertension, this is uh, a benign cause of uh, dual uh, enhancement. There are many underlying causes, but essentially what links these causes are low uh, CSF pressure or low CSF volume conditions. So for example, a post-surgical CSF leak uh, uh, after spinal intervention, rupture of perineal cysts, penetrating injuries, uh, and even uh, can occur spontaneously uh, for no apparent cause. So this is a 64-year-old lady who was admitted with severe orthostatic headache, uh, photophobia, diplopia, neck stiffness. And you can see on this CT study that there's a small uh, left convexity extraaxial collection, which is low attenuation. Is that a, a subdural hygroma or a, a chronic uh, bleed? Um, in view of the symptoms, uh, she had an MRI, um, because clinically uh, the orthostatic headache and the clinical picture was very much of an uh, uh, intracranial hypertension type uh, headache. Uh, and you can see that they're bilateral subdural hygromas, uh, and we, uh, the patient also has diffuse uh, dural enhancement. If you look at the sagittal image, uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, mid-sagittal section uh, looks peculiar. Uh, it looks peculiar in the sense that the posterior fossa contents and supracellar regions are uh, not uh, the, the typical appearance. Uh, 
If you look at the uh, ponds, the ventral surface of the ponds is flattened. It's almost taking the shape of the dorsum of the clivus. Uh, you can see that the tonsils are uh, uh, poking through the foramen magnum here. Things that look a little bit tight. Uh, the supracellar region, you can see the hypothalamus and mammillary bodies are slightly lower than usual. The uh, pontone mammillary distance is reduced. Um, the, the midbrain, instead of looking a bit like a bird's head, looks a bit odd. Uh, and you can see some other signs, uh, such as uh, prominence of the uh, internal cerebral veins, the venous sinuses are congested, uh, sometimes uh, 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 the uh, uh, cavernous sinus can also be prominent. Uh, so this is the so-called sagging brain sign, and it's related to loss of CSF volume and uh, a reduction in the buoyancy effect of the uh, CSF on the brain that allows the brain to perhaps settle down. Um, so sagging brain sign. Um, so what are these symptoms due to? Well, it's thought that the symptoms are due to this caudal uh, descent with stretching of the meninges and possibly also the cranial nerves. Uh, when the patient uh, uh, assumes an upright position. Uh, when occurring spontaneously, this uh, uh, is uh, self, uh, usually self-limiting, uh, perhaps lasting a few weeks or a few months, uh, but you can have specific uh, targeted or non-targeted epidural um, uh, blood patches if uh, the patient does not respond to uh, medical therapy. Uh, sometimes surgery is needed uh, if you can find the cause of the uh, CSF loss. And uh, interestingly, the symptoms improve after a blood patch. And with the symptomatic improvement, we can actually see the MR findings uh, uh, resolving uh, within days. Uh, other causes of dural pathology, well, we've, uh, we've seen lots of examples of meningiomas and dural tails have been mentioned. This is an area of on plant meningioma. Um, you can get dural metastasis, and metastasis can produce fairly uh, a profound uh, dual thickening, but it tends to be irregular, unlike the sort of smooth pattern that we see with the intracranial hypertension. And in both these examples, the uh, calvarium is abnormal. You can see that this is a uh, metastatic prostate disease, which has gone to the bone and then busted through into the dura, um, which is a tough membrane and will, and will protect the sort of subarachnoid space. Uh, so it's unusual for that disease to then go into the subarachnoid space as a, uh, a continuous uh, process. Uh, on the other example, this is a patient with myeloma, and you can see that there's a, a myeloma to some dural mass here. But if you look away from there, here, for example, the dura is abnormal and it's thickened and it's relatively smooth. So not all smooth dural enhancement is benign. You can have metastatic involvement uh, uh, of that, so one needs to be careful about that. But if you look at this example, the bone adjacent to it is also abnormal. So uh, in this case, it's clear that this is a um, metastatic disease. Um, this patient has an ethmoid sinus uh, 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 malignancy. This is actually a melanoma, which is extended through the anterior skull base and also into the orbit. But if you look at a higher section, there's very early dual enhancement, which may be an important indicator of uh, 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 intracranial involvement, particularly when it comes to uh, radical cranial uh, facial surgery. Conditions like sarcoid and TB and vagal granulomatosis, um, these uh, can manifest in dual uh, uh, thickening. Uh, sometimes it's relatively localized and uh, smooth. Other times it can be large dual masses. Uh, and some of the manifestations of these granulomatous diseases extend beyond the dura. Uh, you can also have le leptomeningeal disease and also vascular involvement and vasculitis, which can alter the overall uh, appearance of the condition. So uh, it may not manifest just in terms of dural uh, involvement. This patient has a mass extending along the tentorium and up to the anterior wall of the middle cranial fossa. And uh, this uh, was uh, sarcoid, but it could easily be uh, on part meningioma or metastasis uh, behaving, or lymphoma even behaving in this way. Um, that, but that was sarcoid. Another manifestation of sarcoid is the leptomeningeal enhancement, or leptomeningeal invasion. And you can see here that you've got this sort of uh, uh, leptomeningeal pattern of enhancement within the uh, uh, paracentral lobule region here. And uh, uh, this disease will involve the uh, uh, perivascular spaces and uh, can cause 
uh, edema and inflammatory change in the underlying brain, giving rise to symptoms. And uh, similarly, the third sarcoid case, uh, where you see very extensive uh, changes within the brainstem and cerebellum. Uh, and uh, here, on the post-contrast study, you've got these plaques of tissues which are layered on the uh, arachnoid uh, on the brain surface here. And sometimes these lesions can be mass-like because the granulomas of tissue can penetrate through these perivascular spaces and proliferate within the substance of the brain. So um, uh, the, it starts off as a leptomeningeal process but ends up as a, a parenchymal process. Other causes of dural enhancement or dural thickening are uh, subject dural empyema in a patient who's had uh, mastoid infection. Um, so now onto the last pattern. This is going to be a bit shorter. This is leptomeningeal pattern. And in order to see enhancement in this uh, in this space, you must have disruption of the blood-brain barrier. Otherwise, the contrast agent can't leach out into the tissues of the subarachnoid space. Um, so, leaky vessels is mandatory, um, and the conditions that produce this pattern of change are usually infections and tumours, and then also granulomatous disease, because that produces a, an overlap between the two types. Uh, this is a very interesting example, which we went through recently, you know, of a very sick 57-year-old man who came in with a, uh, a severe pneumonia requiring ventilation. Uh, it was a strep pneumonia organism, but he also had uh, associated septicemia and meningitis, which was proven uh, on CSF evaluation. And, uh, but it uh, became very difficult to uh, wean and it was very tumid. Uh, and MR imaging was requested, and if you look at the T2-weighted sequence, all you see is perhaps a mild hyperintensity at the edges of the brain. Uh, really wouldn't make much of that, but when you go on to the post-contrast study, you can see the most florid uh, meningeal uh, or uh, uh, leptomeningeal pattern of enhancement. Uh, so this is all diffuse enhancement of the leptomeninges. Uh, and if you look at the Uh, the next slide, you can see that this enhancing process actually doesn't stop at the foramen magnum and it in, in fact extends all the way down the surface of his cord. Uh, in addition to that, the diffusion weighted imaging and the ADC maps confirm that he had uh, multiple small uh, infarcts uh, all over the cortex uh, in keeping with probable uh, uh, vasculitis related to this. This is a very uh, characteristic pattern of uh, uh, basal uh, meningitis that one sees uh, with TB, uh, but you can also see the same pattern with leptomeningeal uh, malignancy, uh, carcinomatosis, and uh, sarcoid. And uh, uh, here is another example of leptomeningeal enhancement in the setting of uh, uh, small cell uh, lung cancer, metastatic disease, both in the CSF as well as uh, in the parenchyma. Um, Finally, uh, I think I'll finish on this case because we're running out of time. Um, this is a, a, a patient who um, developed a headache, uh, neck pain, uh, dysphonia, and swallowing difficulties. And this was a patient who had metastatic adenocarcinoma of uh, unknown origin. Um, in view of the neuroscience, uh, uh, a brain MR was performed which showed uh, an odd pattern of uh, meningeal enhancement. What we can see here is that, in fact, on the axial dual echo sequence, uh, you can appreciate the subtle differences between the cortex appearance between the right and the left side here. So th this appears slightly swollen compared to the, the cortex on the other side. It's pretty subtle, but if you then go on to the post-contrast study, you can see that there's some uh, surface enhancement here, and that's a meningeal pattern of enhancement, but very much localised to that area. And then if you go on to the next image, you can see uh, that there is an asymmetric flow uh, within the sinuses, but better confirmed on the CT venogram, which shows that there is a transverse and signal sinus thrombosis. So, um, uh, 
we felt well that this may be just a phenomenon uh, due to the uh, congestion uh, of the vessels because of the sinus uh, thrombosis, but in actual fact the CSF cytology happened to be positive also. Uh, I still think this is probably vascular congestion, but it's just to end with a case where things can be a little bit confusing. Thank you, I'll stop there.